Good evening and welcome to the Saints Home Church of God in Christ small group. Well, it's women's small group. We call it Bible Land, but it's all the same thing. So good to see you. Um, we're going to get started. So if you'd be kind enough to love this post or share it, I'm going to do the same thing. So glad to see all of you tonight. We're going to have a word of prayer and get ready to go. So let me share mine too. I hope everybody had a wonderful day. I hope all is well. Today is Tuesday, November the 10th. And for some of you, tomorrow is a holiday. So that means you're not working, you're not in school, which is nice to have that extra that extra break. So let me, let me share it to uh, share as myself. Good. Hi, mom. I see you. All right. So we're gonna have a word of prayer. Good evening, mom. So good to see you. Mother Nash, our Bible band president and uh, my mom. So glad to have you. Uh, we're going to have a word of prayer. Father God, we love you and we praise you. We're grateful that you are God and we are your people. Lord, as we move into this time of study, we pray that you bless our leaders, bless our spiritual and secular leaders. We decree and declare that all shall be well and that there is peace in the land in the name of Jesus. Lord, you said in your word that no weapon formed against us would prosper. So we are standing on that promise right now. Lord, we thank you for our spiritual leaders. We lift up our own pastor. We lift up our Bible band leader. We lift up everyone that will come into the room and worship with us and study with us tonight, each household that's represented. Open up our understanding so that we can apply this lesson to our lives to be not only hearers of the word, but also doers of the word. And Lord, if anyone is experiencing depression or anxiety or feeling you know, despair because of the things that they're going through. We thank you that this lesson will help us be stronger as Christians, as believers, so that we are able to weather the storms of life the way you told us to in the word. These blessings we ask in your name. Amen. Amen. All right, everyone. Ooh, there's more of you. Hi. Um, so hi, mom. Hi, sister Tashan. Hi, sister Anita. So good to see each and every one of you. I'm excited about this lesson. Um, we are on page 33 of this book. This is Christian Concepts for Growth and Development. And this is the, um, it's a Church of God in Christ curriculum, but you know, I'm not so, it's, it's important for all Christians to be aware of the small foxes that destroy the vine, as the Bible says. So that's what the letter from um, our are the, the supervisor, Lee Van Zant, who write, does a lot of the writings for this book. So she talks about the large, it's not the large foxes that destroy the mind, it's the smaller foxes that destroy the mind. So these are topics geared towards strengthening us to be the kinds of Christians that God is calling for us to be. Sometimes there are some roadblocks to us being people that God wants us to be. So we've been hearing that recurring theme a lot. Um, so it's important for us to continue to pray and study the word of God and spend more time in, in prayer and devotion and, and, and in private study time so that we can get to know God better. Um, and then we will know what is his will. And then we'll know how to pray. We'll know how to conduct ourselves. We'll know how to improve our relationships because we're going to treat people the way God treats people. We're going to love people the way God loves people. So that's what these lessons are geared towards, you know, getting rid of some of those roadblocks to us being the best version of ourselves. So tonight's lesson is God's people must deal with covetousness. So we're going to define a few terms. Our background reading is found in Exodus 20 and 17. Also, we'll go to Exodus 18 and 21. We'll go to Mark 17 and uh, 4 through, I'm sorry, Mark 7, 14 through 23, as well as Romans 1, uh, 23 through 32, and then Hebrews 13 and 5. But first, we're going to start 
with the devotional reading, which is found in Luke chapter 12, verses 13 through 34. So I'm not going to read all of those verses. I'm going to read some of them. I'm going to read some of them, and then we will uh, we'll move into our book. We're on pages 33 through 35 tonight for those of you that have it. For those of you that don't and you want to download it real quick, it's available on Nook, on Kindle, and one more place that Sister Patrice posted on an earlier post, and she posts that usually every week. So if you don't have a copy of the book, you're able to get the digital copy on one of those um, or the Church God in Christ uh, publishing house website, you're able to get it there. So we're going to look at our central verse, which is found in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 3. I'm going to read the King James Version, uh, and it says, But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becometh saints. So the New International Version of that same central verse, it says, but among you, there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or greed because these are improper for God's holy people. And that's found in Ephesians 5, chapter 3. And it's a, it's a, it's, there's a few other verses that are around it, right? There's a few other verses around it. So that's important. When you have time in your personal Bible study time, I challenge you to go back to Ephesians chapter 5 and read uh, the verses that are on top of it and below it, just so that you get a sense of what the Apostle Paul was, was writing to the church at the time, but it also applies to us. So he's saying that for God's holy people, it's there's certain things, certain characteristics, certain things that we're it shouldn't be talked about that we do it. It shouldn't be part of our reputation. It shouldn't be things that we, um, things that when people are talking about our reputation as holy people, that these things should not be named among us. So one of the things he talks about is sexual immorality, um, but tonight's lesson is not about that. Um, so I'm not going to stay there. I'm just going to mention it because it's in the verse. That's why I'm challenging you to read it in your personal time. But he also mentions covetousness, which is greed or wanting to have something that doesn't belong to you, that belongs to someone else. You may have seen my post earlier about it's a common saying that we have today that, you know, some people think the grass is always greener on the other side of the fence. But if we ever took the time to water our own grass, then maybe we would realize that our grass could be just as green they could it could be just as green as any other grass that we see on any other side of the fence um sister anita i thought we sent you one but if i didn't that's my bad i will uh, make sure i send you one one quarter and I'll, I'll i'll send you the download link um so lesson number we're in lesson number 10 and if Oh, if you could text Sister Lashavia, Sister Anita, and see if she will take a picture and send it to you. Maybe she'll do that because I know she has your number because um, I texted the two of you together. So maybe ask her to send you a picture. Okay, so our key terms, there's four of them. We have a lot of key terms tonight. So unscrupulous, malice, incline, and greed. So I'm going to read those definitions as we're going through those definitions. If any of those jog anything for you, feel free to comment in the comment section and say what you need to say. But unscrupulous means not honest or fair, doing things that are wrong, dishonest or illegal, not having or showing regard for what is right and proper. And the opposite of unscrupulous is integral or having integrity. You hear the word integrity a lot, honesty, you hear that a lot. So if someone is not honest, then they're unscrupulous. They have no scruples. They have no morals. They have no regard for other people. So these are things we want to, yes, of the booklet. These are things we want to be aware of. We want to, we want to be aware of our own situation. The Bible, our Bible is a spiritual mirror so we can look at ourselves. We can self-examine 
we can examine ourselves and determine whether we are in the faith or not. We can determine whether we are doing what we're supposed to do. And there's a lot of places where Jesus talks about that while he ministered here on earth during his earthly ministry, because the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the Essenes, all the three different groups, they had a tendency to analyze other people. They wanted to see, you know, they were quick to point the finger and blame other people rather than looking at their own selves. So we don't want to have that as part of our reputation. We don't want to be the one that blames everyone else and never looks at ourselves to see what our responsibility was. So that's unscrupulous. Malice is the desire to cause pain, injury, or distress to another, intent to commit an unlawful act or cause harm without legal justification or excuse. Wasn't there a movie that Tyler Perry made called Malice like a couple of years ago? I think I think it wasn't part, I think that's not in my imagination and I don't know that I saw it. Was there a movie? Malice movie. No, it was a 19, that was a movie made in the 1990s, my God. Uh, well, I guess I was thinking about a Tyler Perry movie. It wasn't a Tyler Perry movie, so. My bad, we'll move on. But malice means the desire to cause pain. You want to hurt somebody. That's not a characteristic that is should be found within the, the makeup of a child of God. We should never want anybody to be hurt. We should never want to hurt anyone. We should never want to cause pain, injury, or distress to anyone. We should never want to commit an unlawful act to hurt anyone. Um, back in the times of the Bible, it was pretty common that people were in an army or they were farmers. There tended to be, you know, the, self, the, the society was very different than it is now. There weren't as many cities, you know, people generally, the only times they had to, you know, take another life was because it was a, you know, they were in, they were part of the army or they were part of the armed forces. And, you know, that was sanctioned in most cases. Now, there were some times where it wasn't, and God spoke about that. But for the most part, it was sanctioned when you were justified. And that's why the definition here says, intent to commit an unlawful act or cause harm without legal justification or excuse. So there are certain things that are excused under the law with respect to causing harm to someone else. Like if it, and you, and our current law even has allowances for that. Incline means to lean, tend, or become drawn toward an opinion or course of conduct, to cause someone to want to do something or to be more likely to do something. And sometimes we can, because of the things that we say and the things that we do, um, we don't just say things verbally nowadays. When we say things, we also say them on our social media. You may say them on Facebook. You may say them on Instagram, or you may post a picture of something on Instagram, or you may you may make a recording that talks about something, and you could influence someone to have an incline, to lean towards doing something. Now, you have the power to either make them lean towards doing something godly, or to make them doing something that's not godly. So those are things we want to be aware of as Christians. What are we leading people into doing? What are we... What are we showing? What are we showcasing? Who are we glorifying? Do we glorify the enemy? Because we constantly talk about how the devil has us down and he's on our track, like constantly talking about the antagonist in our life or talking about our circumstances and giving those more glory than we give God. Or are we blessing the Lord at all times and letting his praise continually be in my mouth? Or is our soul making her boast in the Lord? Will the humble hear thereof and be glad? Are we magnifying the Lord more than we magnify our circumstances? These are things that we think about as children of God. Are we glorifying God more than we glorify our, our circumstances? Good or bad. Sometimes we glorify good circumstances more than we glorify God. Sometimes we glorify bad circumstances more than we glorify God, as if he can't deliver us or as if he didn't have a plan for us to go through a certain trial or tribulation. So those are things we want to examine ourselves and we want to think about. The last definition of the key term, it's greed. Greed, a selfish or ex and excessive desire for more of something such as money or possessions or um, 
something that you want to possess that you want more of. So it's a, that's a characteristic to want more of something that you already have enough of because you just want more of it um, than is needed, than is necessary for you to have more of. So unscrupulous, malice, incline, and greed. We're going to read Luke chapter 12. We're going to go there. I'm not reading all the verses. So again, this is something that we can look at during our personal Bible study time. We can look at this during our personal Bible study time. I'm going to read the New Living Translation because if I stay here in Luke, it would take me this whole hour. And then mom will be like, uh, you need to watch the clock. So I don't want her to have to send me a message like that. So uh, Luke chapter 12, the whole Luke chapter 12 verses 1 through 12 is a warning against hypocrisy. And then Jesus tells a parable in verses 13 through 21 about a rich, the, this, this says a rich fool. Um, we know that somebody who's not wise is foolish. And, you know, we've been taught not to call anybody, you know, because that's, that's an insult in many cases. But if it is what it is at this point. If the Bible calls you a fool, then the Bible's calling you a fool. And I don't, I don't cross the Bible. I believe the Bible. So Jesus tells the parable of the rich fool from verses 13 to 21. And then from verses 22 to 34, he teaches about money and possessions. And that's important. Money and the, our pastor here at Saints Home, he teaches us about money. Money is a tool. Money isn't a desired end. It's not the end result. Um, when you prioritize your life, so that the end result is achieving more money, then you've gotten your priorities out of whack, especially in our biblical economy, especially in our, you know, in a, with it, when you look at spiritual ethics, when you look at things from a spiritual or heavenly perspective, um, we're not, you know, gaining more and more and more money, more and more and more material possessions, is not the desired end, but having enough money to bless God, bless his people, bless your family and bless and do what you need to do as an individual in society, that's a good thing. However, having enough is great. It's, it's a good thing, but being greedy and having extra, that's what Jesus talks about. So we're going to look at some of these key verses here in Luke chapter 12. So I hope you have it. We're going to go there and do that now. Ooh, it's already 7, 18. Okay, so Luke chapter 12, verses 13 through 34. So the parable of the rich. Then, so, And I'm reading New Living Translation. Then someone called from the crowd, Teacher, please tell my brother to divide our father's estate with me. Verse 14, Jesus replied, Friend, who made me a judge over you to decide such things? as that. Then he said, beware, guard against every kind of greed. Life is not measured by how much you own. And then he told them a story. A rich man had a, far, a farm that produced fine crops. And then he said to himself, what should I do? I don't have room for all my crops. Then he said, I know I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. Then I'll have room enough to store all my wheat and other goods. Verse 19 says, and I'll sit back and say to myself, my friend, you have enough stored away for years to come. Now take it easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, this is verse 20, but God said to him, you fool, you will die this very night. Then who will get everything you worked for? Verse 21, yes, a person is a fool to store up earthly wealth, but not have a rich relationship with God. And we're very familiar with, there's a verse there's a verse that says, what profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? What profit a man scripture? And that's Mark chapter 8, verse 35. Let's see, 34 through 35. Oh, 836. There it is. But you start earlier. See, verse 30, Mark chapter 8, verse 35 through 38. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospels, the same shall save it. Verse 36 of Mark chapter 8 says, For whosoever, for what shall it profit a man 
if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give up in exchange for his soul? Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes into glory of his Father with his holy angels. So we don't want Jesus to be ashamed of us before his Father. So if we're ashamed of him now in this life, he's going to be ashamed of us in the in eternity, in eternal when, when it's time to determine who has eternal life and who doesn't. So I don't want to be in that number. I don't want Jesus to be ashamed of me. I want Jesus to say, "This is this is mine." I, don't, I want him to say, "I want him to say, well done, thou good and faithful servant." That's what I want to hear when we when I when I go to heaven. I want to hear, "Well done, thou good and faithful servant." I don't want to hear, "Depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you." That's not what I want to hear. So these lessons are geared towards helping us be in that number. And it's going to be a process. As long as God gives us the chance every day to get up and get it right, will we always get it right? No, we're not always going to get it right. Sometimes we're going to make mistakes because some things are disguised and they're intended to be roadblocks. They're intended to be hindrances. But the word of God, the Holy Spirit, having a good relation, a close relationship with God, he will reveal things to us so we stop making the mistakes that can separate us from God. That will help. This will help us stop making those same mistakes over and over so that we are not separated from God. The Holy Spirit will, he will reveal things to you that you would have no other way of knowing. And that's amazing. So let's see, we stopped at the end of the parable. And so then from verses 22 through 34, Jesus teaches about money and possessions. This is where I'm not going to read all of it. I'm just going to read a couple ones, a couple of the verses. So verse 22 says, then turning to his disciples, Jesus said, that's why I tell you not to worry about everyday life, whether you have enough food to eat or enough clothes to wear, for life is more than food and your body is more than clothing. Look at the ravens. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns for God feeds them. So Jesus is reminding his disciples that rather than prioritizing things so that you have enough food to eat or clothes to wear, or, you know, I'm going to work, I need to work 18, there's 24 hours in a day. We sleep eight hours. You know, I need two jobs so that I can afford to live in Los Angeles, California. Some of us are in that predicament because it's expensive to live here in this market. And we're worried about that. But you know, we can turn things over to the Lord when we tithing is a trust. It's a trust. It's it's walking by faith. When you tithe, you give back to God, our source, 10% or a little more of what he gave you. And you're saying to God, I trust you, God. I trust you with what you gave me. And he and you're showing him he can trust you because you're doing what he asked. He doesn't want everything that we have. He doesn't want all of it. He just wants a portion of it. And he wants us. He wants to know that he can trust us. So he wants to know that we don't prioritize money. We don't love money more than we love him. The Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil. We had a lesson about that. Lesson number five. I think I taught that one too. Lesson number five. It's on page 18 of the same book, how money affects the minister and the ministry. Some people get it twisted. This is like part two of that lesson. My God today. Um, so it's important to not desire the things that other people have. Now on social media, you see more than ever before. We have more access into seeing what people want to show us. Let me say it that way on social media. Some people only show you a portion of their life. They show you the fancy part. They show you the vacations and the trips, but you don't see everything. Some people show you everything. Like if they're having a bad day, they're going to tell you on social media. If they got a promotion, they're going to tell you on social media. If they had a rough day at work, they're going to tell you on social media. Some people post everything. Some people only post good stuff and some people only post bad stuff. So you can't look at what you see in a picture. It's not adequately captured. And so when the Bible talks about 
not wanting everything that our neighbor has, you don't fully know the, the picture of what's going on in your neighbor's house. You may want what you see, but you don't know what it took to get what your neighbor had. You don't know what process they go to through to maintain it. And so the beautiful thing about a relationship with God is he makes each of us exactly the way we're supposed to be. He gives us different gifts and talents. He, we, he enables us to do different things at different times. So destinational happiness, I used to suffer with that. I'll be transparent. I used to suffer with destinational happiness. I used to say, okay, well, when this happens, then I'll be happy. So when I was in high school, I would say, oh, I can't wait to get out of high school. When I get to college, I'll be happy. And then when I was in college, it was like, oh, when I'm out of college and I don't have to work full time and go to college at the same time, then I'll be happy. So that was none of that was the destination is not what's going to make you happy because then you start to miss out on the journey that God has put you on and you don't appreciate that what he does for you along the path that he has placed you on. Like Psalm 23 says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. David is talking about the journey of the shepherd. So he was a shepherd, so he was outside a lot. So you didn't hear David complaining, oh, I'm not in the house as much as my brothers are. They got me out here in the fields taking care of these sheep. No, he said, the Lord is my shepherd because he was a shepherd of the sheep and he knew that God was watching over him and God was leading and guiding him. So he too had a shepherd, even though he was a shepherd, hallelujah. He was a shepherd who had a shepherd. So we may be, you know, we may be the priest of our home because we're not married. Maybe you're single. And so you're the adult. So you're in charge of your home, but God is in charge of you. So you don't have to shoulder the burden alone because God has you. And he makes you to lie down in green pastures. So he's going to put you on the right path. Green pastures are nice. Have you ever been outside? Of, for, well, for all of you that aren't allergic to grass and, 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 and all the stuff outside, you enjoy being outside, like going on a picnic. It's nice. It's nice to be outside. The sun is shining. There may be a few clouds to make it not too hot. And, and God just takes you exactly where you're supposed to go. Um, so these are, we can enjoy the journey. So when I was in high school and junior high, a popular show on TV was about college, you know, a different world. So I was like, cool, when I get to college, it's going to be like a different world. I'm going to be able to hang, I'm going to make some new friends. I'm going to hang out with my friends. And, you know, even if I have to work because my parents were not rich and I knew I needed to work for many of the years I was in school and I did, and I wasn't unhappy about it. But it was hectic, right? It was hectic to work and go to school. Like I didn't have time to do a lot of the things that are part of the typical college experience. I didn't join a sorority because I didn't have the money and I didn't have the time. I needed to, I was working full time for three of my four years. So those kinds of things, you think it's going to be like, oh, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that when I get there. And then you get to that destination and then you see the reality of what it takes to stay in that destination. And then all the things that you thought it was, it's not that. So you may have missed out on things in your earlier part of your journey because you were too concerned looking forward and not enjoying where God had already placed you. So those are things we want to be aware of. Hopefully we've learned that lesson from, we've learned that lesson where we're not so focused on where we're trying to go and we focus all our, our time, all our energy, all of our effort, and all of our prayer, which is the most important part of everything I just said. We focus all of our prayer, like if we're single and we want a husband, you constantly pray about wanting a husband. You don't pray about anybody else. You don't pray about nothing else. You constantly focus on making sure your hair and nails and clothes and look right and you're working out so you look good. So you're not saving for retirement, and putting money in your 401k and maximizing the match that your employer gives you, you're spending money to go to the nail shop every other week, get your pedicure, make sure your toes and your hands and your hair, your hair is done and you have the latest clothes and a cute purse, but you could be spending, you could be putting some of that money into savings. And so then when you get 40, 50, 60 or 70, and then you're retired and all you have to live off of is 
the social security, if there even, even is social security by the time you get there, you're going to want some of those trips to the nail shop and you're going to want some of those trips to the hair salon back because you have to always keep getting your hair done. You always have to keep getting your nails done or you could learn to do them your own. Or you can learn to do your hair on your own, just like we've had to do during this pandemic. So these are we, we want to start making better decisions. We want to start looking to the Lord and letting him order our steps, making wise decisions. You know, being a Proverbs 31 woman, even before you are married, learning how to, you know, cook for yourself, save some of that money, don't eat out two or three times a day and go to Starbucks. You can make your own coffee at home, make you bring your own lunch a few times a week. And then, and then make dinner a few times a week at home and save a bunch of money. Put that money aside for something other than wasting it. So Jesus taught about that. And he didn't want us to be so focused on getting more and more and more and more. And that's what the society and this culture is, is grooming our children to want more than what they have. They want the next this. They want the next that. And we were too. We wanted the next cat. I wanted a Cabbage Patch Kid. I wanted a beach cruiser. I wanted, you know, we wanted what we wanted. And we, we would tell our parents, we would ask. Hopefully they would, you know, they'd say, well, if you, you know, maybe if you're well behaved or you get this. Nowadays, it seems a little differently. So those are things we want to, you know, we don't want to constantly go to God and beg like he's Santa Claus. He's not. Ooh, 730. All right. Introduction. God's holy people. And I'm reading from the bottom of the page. God's holy people should be men and women who show good characteristics of their of their lives as they lead and teach God's people. They must be very careful because four powerful enemies of the heart, guilt, anger, greed, or covetousness and jealousy can destroy the effectiveness of believers. They must not be allowed to fester in the mind of a believer. Fester means hang around, to wait. Um, and this is similar to uh, when you think about, there's a, there's a verse, second, uh, second Corinthians chapter 10, verses three through five. Read that on your own time. I'm gonna put that in the chat. Uh, I want you, I challenge you to read that on your own time. Get familiar with that because it talks about the thoughts that we're having. It talks about the weapons of our warfare not being carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. And it reminds us, uh, later it goes into talking about the thoughts that are in our mind. So there's some thoughts that the enemy tries to place in your mind that are not your thoughts. They're contrary to what the Bible teaches us. And, and as we get closer to God, they're contrary to the things that God would want us to do. They're contrary to living a clean, spiritual life. They're contrary to being holy. They're opposite of it. So the enemy will try to plant things in our mind. And so this passage of scripture in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, it talks about recognizing those thoughts that are trying to encourage us to not be subject to Christ and taking those thoughts and, and rooting them out and then making them subject to Christ. So I challenge you, if you're not familiar with that passage of scripture, to read it. But guilt, anger, greed, or covetousness and jealousy can be motivators to do things that are outside of the character of what God wants us to do. So so these, these passages of scripture are going to help us. So we're turning to page 34, and it says, God began early in the Old Testament warning his people about the sin of covetousness. God told his people not to covet things that belong to their neighbor. It's all right to desire something similar, but not what is exclusively theirs. It has been said the grass is always the grass always looks greener on the other side of the fence. If you attend your grass, it too will be green. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. But my, my mom used to, there's a song and it says sweep around your own front door. Sometimes and that, that's twofold. Sometimes we're quick to criticize other people and what they're doing. We want to criticize what their house looks like. Or we want to criticize, you know, what's going on in their life. We can't, or we don't want to, you know, be happy with them when good things happen. Or we don't want to mourn with them when, when things they're going through. Um, that's two-sided. 
but it's also we need to attend to what God has given us. We need to take care of what God has given us. So these are important things. And covet, again, that means yearn to possess or have something that belongs to something else. So that's important for us to remember what that means. So we're going to go to the background reading. We're going to look at Exodus. We're going to go to Exodus. Let me put those in the Exodus. We're going to go to Exodus 20 and 17. We're going to go to Exodus, Exodus 18 and 21. And then we're going to go to Mark 7, 14 through 23. So we're going to do those. And then we're going to, that way you have those in case you didn't. I didn't realize you didn't have a book. I'm sorry, Sister Need. I'll do better. Um, Romans 1, 23 through 32. And Hebrews 13 and 5. So we're going to read all of these. We're going to read them in the New Living Translation for the sake of time. Um, typically I'm obedient and I read them in King James version, but I only have an hour and I don't want to get in trouble. So we're going to start reading these now. Okay. So first we'll read Exodus 20 and 17. And it says, and these are, this is the chapter where God gave Moses the 10 commandments. So 20 and 17 says, you must not covet your neighbor's house. You must not cover, covet your neighbor's wife male or female servant, ox or donkey, or anything else that belongs to your neighbor. So this is the commandment that was given, because this is part of the Ten Commandments. When you look at the whole chapter, it's all the Ten Commandments that were given. And the Ten Commandments is like a microcosm of the law that was given as the people, the children of Israel left Egypt. They were at Mount Sinai. Okay, so next we're going to read Exodus 18, and 21. Exodus 18 and 21. And again, I'm reading the New Living Translation and it says, but select from all the people some capable, honest men who fear God and hate bribes. Appoint them as leaders over groups of 100, 100, I'm sorry, 1,000, 100, 50, and 10. So this was uh, Moses's father-in-law Jethro giving Moses some advice on leadership. So we're going to circle back to that in just a minute. But the way, the important part there is that how he described the people that Moses was to look for. That's the important part of that verse. Okay, we're going to go to Mark chapter 7, verses 14 through 23. And that says... Then Jesus called to the crowd to come and hear. All of you listen, he said, and try to understand. It's not what goes into your body that defiles you. You are defiled by what comes from your heart. Verse 17, then Jesus went into a house to get away from the crowd and his disciples asked him what he meant by the parable he had just said. In verse 18, he said, don't you understand either, he asked. Can't you see that the food you put in your body does not def cannot defile you? Food doesn't go into your heart, but only passes through the stomach and then goes out the sewer. By saying this, he declared that every kind of food is acceptable in God's eyes, which was mind-blowing. It was a mind-blowing concept to them as Jews at that time. Verse 20, then he added, it is what comes from inside that defiles you. For from within, out of a person's heart, comes evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, wickedness, deceit, lustful desires, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. All of these vile things come from within, and they are what defile you. So we've just read um, Mark chapter 7, verses 14. Through 23, we're going to move on to Romans chapter 1. Ooh, time is moving. 1, 23 through 32. I may not read all of these. This, this, the, this section of Romans chapter 1 starts at verse 18 and goes to the end of the chapter, which is 32. And it talks about God's anger at sin. So at this point in Romans chapter 1, 
Paul was writing to the church at in Rome and Rome, if you know anything about the Roman Empire and you know anything about why the Roman Empire dissolved, fell apart, you know, went to ruins and the Greek Empire, same thing before it. And a lot of people would compare it to the United States now. Um, there was a lot of wickedness that was accepted in society. And so that was the opposite of what the Jews and the Christians were taught to do in terms of their moral compass, in terms of their, their amount of integrity. So it was very different than what they were taught to do as believers and as Jewish believers. It was very different, similar to today. There are a lot of things that are lawful under the United States law that as Christians, we don't agree with, and so we don't practice in it either, and we pray for those that do. So this is, this is where you begin to look at your integrity as a believer versus the integrity of other people. And again, you're not judging people, you're just going to do as an individual believer, and as a church, we wanna do the things that are, that are right in the sight of God. And that's not always going to be right in the sight of the culture or the world in which we live. Our code of ethics will be different than those of other people who don't believe in God, who don't believe that there's a God, or they may believe there's a God because the Bible says that demons tremble and because they've seen glory, you know, they've seen, they see what's happening spiritually because they're spirit. So they have a little more, they can see things that we don't because we are human. We're, we're souls that have a body and a spirit. So we don't see everything until the Lord spiritually opens our eyes. So as we grow as Christians, as believers, God will open your eyes, uh, especially if you pray and ask him to. And it's his will that you know certain things. He doesn't want you to know everything and be overwhelmed. He wants us to know enough to trust him. And so he'll continue to show us that. So God was angry at sin. And that's what this passage in Romans chapter 1, verses 23 through... Um, 32. So I'm gonna read a few verses of that and then move into Hebrews 13 and then we're gonna talk. So 23 says, and instead of worshiping the glorious ever living God, they worshiped idols made to look like mere people and birds and animals and reptiles. So God abandoned them to do whatever shameful things their hearts desired. As a result, they did vile and degrading things with each other's bodies. They traded the truth about God for a lie. So they worshiped and served the things God created instead of the creator himself, who is worthy of eternal praise. Amen. Verse 26, that is why God abandoned them to their shameful desires. Even the women turned against the natural way to have sex and instead indulged in sex with each other. And the men, verse 27, instead of having normal sexual relations with women, burned with lust for each other. Men did shameful things with other men, and as a result of this sin, they suffered within themselves the penalty they deserved. So since they thought it was foolish to acknowledge God, he abandoned them to their foolish thinking and let them do the things that should never be done. Um, so then verses 29 through 30 goes on to talk about, you know, the condition, how because they were aband abandoned and turned over to their lusts completely, then it talks about um, their lives becoming full of every type of wickedness. So you can read that in your own time. You probably, knowing you, you probably already have. Excuse me. You probably already have read it. Okay. So we're going to read the last verse, which is Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5. And it says, don't love money. Be satisfied with what you have. For God has said, I will never fail you. I will never abandon you. Let me see what the King James says. 13.5 says, let your, in King James, let your conversation, conversation in the 16th century version of English means lifestyle, okay? It doesn't mean like conversation like I'm talking to you. That's what we, as a society in English, the word conversation has changed meaning since the 16th century. So here conversation means lifestyle. Let your lifestyle, let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. For he hath said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So he's quoting what Jesus said. And Jesus said he would never leave us nor forsake us. So we don't have to be so concerned 
with the love of material possessions, with the love of money, with the love of prestige or the love of being, you know, critically acclaimed by everyone, but the love of, you know, professional success. I, I still, I'm working to balance that even as we speak. I don't have to be so, so concerned about professional success because where God wants me to go, God's going to send me there and that's okay. So those are things we want to keep in mind. So we're going to read the discussion and talk about it. It's already 745. Um, so our discussion, we're on page 34. I'm going to read this. And if you have any thoughts on what I'm saying, feel free to put it in the chat and I'll see it. I'm keeping an eye on the chat. Thank you, Sister Anita. I'm keeping an eye on the chat. So we're discussing covetousness. We're discussing the danger of wanting things that do not belong to you, that specifically belong to other people, and you wanting those things instead of focusing on the things that God has already given you. So as a believer, that is dangerous territory because it makes you not focus on your own gifts and talents. And it makes you, it places you in a position where you're being disobedient because you're not using what you have to do what God wants you to do, not only for yourself and your family, but in the kingdom of God. And when God uses us you know, to do the things he's enabled us or prepared us to do, then we're, and we're being obedient, then we flourish, the people around us flourish. Yes, we will go through, we still deal with hard times. We still deal with persecution. We still suffer. The Bible says that the righteous shall suffer persecution. You know, days, every day will not be easy. But when you know that you're being obedient to God, when you know that you're living all that you know how, and you're doing everything that he has instructed you to do, then you know that you're positioned where you're supposed to be. You're in the right place at the right time. And you can trust that you're in the right place at the right time because you're obedient and doing what God has told you to do. You've always, you've all known someone or known someone who knew someone who was in the wrong place at the wrong time, or you suffer with the shoulda, woulda, couldas, and you question every single decision you make because you, you question, should you have gone right or should you have gone left? But when we're walking the way God tells us to walk, when we're doing what God instructed us to do, when we're being obedient. When we work with what he's given us, we're going to be in the best possible position and we can always trust God that we're exactly where we're supposed to be. And if we're not where we're supposed to be, he will send a way to tell us. Either he'll tell us himself, if we're not hearing that, he'll send someone to tell you or he'll let you read a verse or he'll let someone minister to you in a way that answers your prayer to know exactly where you're supposed to be and what you're supposed to be doing. So the discussion says, so many of God's people have been blessed in the church, but because of greed, they can't seem to get enough. Many people have been faithful in their giving of tithe and offerings, and God's laws of prosperity have worked in their lives. However, when one cannot be satisfied and must constantly seek to attain more through unscrupulous practices, God is not pleased. Covetousness is a very dangerous thing because it deals with what is in the heart of a person. So, you know, the Bible says that man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. So it's very important. God who knows and sees all. God who can look at our heart. He knows exactly what's in our heart. And he will bring in the process of our sanctification personally. He will help us to do what it says in the Bible. The Bible says to lay aside the weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. So the Bible doesn't only focus on laying aside sin. The Bible talks about laying aside weight because there are some things that are not a sin, but it could be a personal problem. It could pose a personal issue or problem for me or for you because it connects with something that God knows is in our heart that we don't even know is in our heart yet because God knows us better than we know ourselves. So he's trying to put us on the right path 
and prepare us so that our character is ready to handle all of the blessings we're going to have, handle all the situations we're going to be in, handle the people who will be in our lives, handle the relationships, handle our children. Like some people, before they have children, there's things that God has done to prepare their character to be ready to be a parent to those children. Before you get married, there are certain things that God has done in your life or placed in your life to prepare you to have the right character to be ready to marry that man or marry that woman. But until you go through those things and your character is prepared for the blessings you're praying for, you're not going to be ready for those blessings. And those, those blessings or that situation could consume you or it could put you off track. And it takes a while to get back on track when you're not on track with God, when you're not on track the way God, where God wants you to be. So um, covetousness is dangerous because it can it deals with what's in the heart of a person. Jesus tells the story of a young man who came to him and asked him to speak to his brother about dividing their inheritance. So the young man already knew the law. So Deuteronomy 21 and 17, the, the practice back in the day was that the oldest son got the majority of the estate and the younger sons or and the daughters, for that matter, they got a smaller portion. Most of what was passed along went to the oldest son. That's why there was that problem between Esau and, and Jacob. And back in Genesis, you're all familiar with that story, how Jacob tricked Esau, partnering with his mom. They tricked their father, who was older and blind. First, he tricked his brother into selling him his birthright for a bowl of soup. And then he tricked his father into giving him the prayer that was intended for his older brother, the blessing that was intended for his older brother. So that, all the jealousy, the greed, the envy, the covetousness, because they were twins. And Esau was born mere seconds before, he was born first. They were twins, they were in the womb at the same time. And they tussled even in the womb. So Jacob had been suffering with this condition since before he was even born, but God knew that. God knew that. God knew what was in Esau's heart. God knew what was in Jacob's heart. God knows what's in your heart. God knows what's in my heart. So God is going to continue to give you what you need to work out your own soul salvation with fear and trembling. He's going to give you the Holy Spirit. If you haven't been, if you haven't felt the move of the Holy Spirit in a while, seek to fill him again. Ask for a refilling. Because the Holy Spirit leads us and guides us and he helps us to do what we need to do day after day. So the one who called out in the passage we read, he knew the law, but he had a greedy spirit. He wanted more of what rightfully belonged to his older brother. So some brothers don't, who are oldest, they don't want to be in charge of the estate. And so they will share with their younger brothers or will, you know, let someone else be the one that, you know, receives the mantle of being tasked with, you know, running the estate the way their father did or the way their parents did. You know, some older brothers understand that they're not as business minded as others and they'll step aside or they'll, you know, they'll engage with their other siblings. But the younger one is the one who wanted Jesus to take his side in this matter, as it says in the book. So Jesus took this occasion to give a warning concerning the dangerous spirit of covetousness. So Jesus wants us to just, I want you to just know there's more to life than material things. Don't be blinded by material things. So then Jesus tells another story about a man who spent so much time working that all he wanted to do was to keep filling up his barns. And the man probably was a hard worker, but he, was, he wasn't concerned with the poor people that lived around him who may have needed food. He wasn't concerned, um, about anyone other than himself because he spent all of his time accumulating earthly wealth. So Jesus called him a fool. So the next story, the next um, parable in Luke chapter 12, Jesus talks about believers who are so focused on material things that they fail to seek the spiritual benefits of the kingdom. So that's why we talked about you not only seeking the Lord about a husband, you're not only seeking the Lord about a car, you're not only seeking the Lord about material possessions. When you see all the spiritual blessings of the Lord, the spiritual blessing of the Holy Spirit, the spiritual blessing of salvation, the spiritual blessing of, of, of redemption, of God snatching you back, the spiritual blessings of grace and mercy and the goodness of God, 
all those things are more valuable than a car, more valuable than a house, more valuable than um, a, a handsome husband or a beautiful wife. All those, because everything that you see with your eyes, these things are all temporary. So God, Jesus wanted to remind us that the spiritual blessings, the things that we cannot see with our eyes, those things are eternal. They last forever. Our soul lasts forever. See, there's the watch the clock message. I'm watching mom. So in conclusion, we shouldn't worry about the natural things that we can see with our eye because they're temporary. We should worry, not worry, but we should, we should seek for those things that are eternal, a relationship with God, letting Jesus be in our heart, um, remembering that you know God is our source and he has us. He's going to take care of it. His timing is perfect. So if we seek him when we make decisions, before we make decisions, and don't just seek him when we're in trouble, but we talk to him all the time, then we'll be exactly where we're supposed to be. And if we're not, he'll tell us because we're in relationship with him. Um, conclusion, covetousness is so destructive that the word of God tells the believer, don't even let the conversation be with covetousness, but rather to be content with what he has. The word tells the believer to incline his heart to his testimonies and not to covetousness. The, the book gives us Psalm 119 and 36. I also want to give you Philippians 4 and 11 and the verses after it, as well as 1 Timothy 6, 6 through 11. 1 Timothy 6 and 6 says, but godliness with contentment is great gain. And that's one of my affirmations. It's one of my personal affirmations that I say to myself. Um, I used to hear my godmother say that all the time when we would pray. But godliness with contentment is great gain. If I can just be content with what God blesses me to have and just be as godly, live all that I know how to live, then that will get me farther than anything else that I could try to do on my own. So questions. Question number one, what causes a person to covet what belongs to another? Question number one, what, go ahead and when you answer these questions in the comments, put Q1 for, you know, question number one, put Q2 for question number two, if you're going to answer that one, um, and put Q3 and then your answer. So question number two is, why is covetousness dangerous to the life of the believer? Why is covetousness dangerous to the life of the believer? And question number three, give one of the examples that Jesus gave about covetousness and the results of covetousness. And we've talked about a few of the parables that we read um, in our, our background reading and our devotional reading tonight. Our essential thought, take your focus off what others have and be content with what you have. So this goes along with that saying we have, the grass is not always greener on the other side. The grass is greener where you water it. So let's let's start taking our focus off of what we see that others have. We can be content with what we have. And then the Bible tells us to look unto Jesus, who is the author and the finisher of our faith. If we can keep our focus on God, if we can prioritize you know, the things that, that God has for us to do, he's going to take care of everything else. He's going to take care of everything else because that's the kind of God that we serve. Thank you, Sister Anita, for answering question number question number one. And you said, question number one, what causes a person to covet what belongs to another? Jealousy or the desires that they have in their heart. That's right. Jealousy could cause it. That's a good point. The desires they have in their heart, the dangerous things, greed, you know, um, wanting, you know, what causes a person to covet what belongs to another? Sister Anita said jealousy or the desires they have in their heart, the evil desires they have in their heart. Thank you for answering that question. And then question number two doesn't have an answer yet, but I see that Sister Tashawn and Mother Nash both answered question number three. So question number two, why is covetousness dangerous to the life of the believer? Um, it's in the book. I saw dangerous twice, but it's in the conclusion. So question two, it's dangerous because the word of the word of God talks about being content and covetousness is the opposite of contentment. Wanting what someone else has does not go along with godliness. 
So these are things we want to keep in mind. Ooh, Sister Pastor Patty, thank you for joining us. So three things. Sister Tashawn said, question number three, the answer to give one examples that Jesus gave about covetousness and the results of covetousness in Joshua chapter, I'm sorry, Joshua chapter seven, verses 20 through 22, when Achan stole the, he stole um, 200 pieces of silver, 200 silver coins and bars of gold and buried them. He brought judgment on himself and all of his people for his covetousness. That's a great example. Look at this. Come on. Come on here. Bible scholar. All right, Sister Tashan. All right. And mom said malice, selfishness, and greedy spirit. And then Pastor Patty said uh, one of the examples that Jesus gave was the story of the man who built larger barns and felt he was okay because he had amassed large quantities of food. When he told his soul to take rest, the Lord caused him to pass away. Question what was really important. That's important. That's important for us. Um, very important for us to make sure that we are aligned, our, our values and our integrity is aligned with what God has for us to do. And Pastor Patty, thank you for answering Question number two, you can read it in the comments with us. Covetousness is dangerous because it changes your focus to materialism and not to God's principles. That's great. Our essential thought, take your focus off of what others have and be content with what you have. Thank you all for joining us tonight. If you don't know the Lord and you want to know more about him, we're going to pray and we're going to wrap up now. But um, in the comments, we will add our link. There's a motorcycle, you can hear him. Um, we're gonna add our link where you can know how to know more about God. And uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna pray for you and we want to get to know you and we want to continue to you know, study the word with you. And if you're not in our area, we wanna partner, you know, send you, give you recommendations on Bible believing churches in your area. Um, and if you wanna be a blessing to this ministry, you can find us on Cash App, dollar sign Saints Home, C-O-G-I-C, or find us on GiveLify. We're Saints Home Church of God in Christ in the city of Los Angeles. Thank you all for joining with us. Father God, we thank you. We love you. We praise you. We thank you. Thank you for this word tonight. We thank you for helping us to recognize when we envy or when we covet things that don't belong to us. Lord, help us to be content. We thank you for purposing in our heart that we are going to be content with what you've given us. We're going to grow right where you have planted us. We're going to be content because godliness with contentment is great gain. Lord, we thank you for each and every one that studied with us tonight. Bless them, bless their household. Continue to just richly dwell in them in the name of Jesus. Lord, the things that they're seeking you for, continue to minister to them as they need to be ministered to. And we'll be so careful to give you the praise and the glory. And Lord, if anyone under the sound of my voice digitally is not saved and wants to be saved. Lord, we know that you will enable them. You will let the, Jesus come into their heart so that they make you Lord of their life and they'll confess it with their mouth and believe it in their heart. In the name of Jesus, bless each one that gave, bless the gift and the giver. These blessings we ask in your name, amen. And Lord, we thank we so we thank you for spending this time with us tonight. Join us again next week for small group Join us tomorrow on the prayer line and join us on Thursday for Bible study. I love you with the love of the Lord. I hope to see you soon. God bless you.